In the summer of 2016, I lived in Portland. I'd been there for eight years, but I was, I was pretty much ready to leave. Like many San Diego hipsters before me, I fled my sunny home for the Pacific Northwest for more band shirt compliments and <laughs> lived where it, was, where it felt more conducive to be an artist. I like to refer to such people as this as cultural refugees. And I identified as such, more or less. Creatively, things were moving along. I started doing stand-up comedy, but I had no concept of how to have a career or rise out of my amateur mindset. I just did showcases, maybe a local festival, but clubs wouldn't touch me. I was a loose cannon. I worked for the IT help desk at a local hospital. <laughs> I mean, it was okay. It was a union job. It had benefits, but it really wasn't for me. I mean, I, I, I will admit, though, I did get pretty good at explaining what a special character is to the elderly. <laughs> I'd gone through a painful breakup earlier that year, too, which, of course, encourages me, people, anyone, just to move on. You know, life in Portland had become stale. It just so happened, as I was putting out my feelers uh, for a place to go other than Portland, a friend who had grown up on the big island of Hawaii said her friend's mom lived on the east part of the island, had an extra room in her house, liked having guests, and they were just, they heard about my situation, heard I wanted to leave, and just encouraged me to come out and stay in Hawaii. One-way ticket. But there was a catch. I would be expected to help out around the property in exchange for little to no rent. Fine. Sounded like a great deal to me, you know? I was desperate for any excuse to change my horizons, and this sounded perfect. It also seemed reckless and irresponsible, but that just made me want to go even more. <laughs> so I sold, gave away, and stored all of my things, arranged to have my car shipped to the island, and put in notice at my job. It was pretty crazy. Um, but I was pretty satisfied when I arrived in Hilo. It felt like my whole world had been dipped in LSD. <laughs> there was so much visual stimulation. The air was filled with you know, humidity and also this notorious croak of the koki frog. I don't know if you've heard it. I got to like it, but it's an invasive species that locals mostly despise. My friend's mom, Mia, an Indonesian woman, and her daughter picked me up at the airport, and after a scenic tour of Hilo, they took me back to the town of Keao, where they lived, just a little bit south of Hilo. The house was a simple one-story, three-bedroom place on an acre of land. The area behind the house was overgrown and cluttered with junk cars and junk boats. I thought it added to the charm of the place somehow. I just like junk cars. And there was a large enclosure with a family of wild pigs. And that was totally unexpected. The adults were massive, and the males, if provoked, could gore you with their tusks. So I was warned to never go back there, which they didn't need to tell me twice. I'm not going to jump back and forth. Still, <laughs> still, they were fascinating to look at. But not far from the pig enclosure was a row of kennels with eight hunting dogs in them. And it seemed like poor design. Seemed like poor design, having the pigs and the dogs that are trained to hunt them kept right next to each other. But I kept my opinions to myself. When I saw the dogs up close, though, I was shocked. They were filthy, malnourished. A couple of them still had injuries from a recent hunt. Another was just senile. Like when it tried to bark, it would just like come out as a wheeze. It would just go... <gasps> <gasps> How was that dog going to hunt anything? It was my first week of being on the island, and my life had become a Sarah McLaughlin video. <laughs> and I didn't know much about pig hunting culture in Hawaii, but guessed that because these were hunting dogs, it was best not to think of them as pets. They were working dogs. Maybe it's justifiable to starve them a little. Maybe they'll make them better at hunting. That didn't change my reaction when I saw them. Seeing those dogs in those filthy kennels made me sad and angry. There's no good excuses for what I saw other than being dumb and lazy. 
The next morning, I asked as many questions as I could without being too insulting. I didn't want to shame my hosts. My host Mia and her husband, Jean, were going through a divorce. The dogs were Jean's. Jean was a pig hunter. He was a giant of a man with a shaved head, uninterested eyes, and forearms like Popeye. He was a white man, originally from the Midwest, who had acclimated to the Big Island so much that he was as native as a Howley could get. He was a firefighter, a pig hunter, like I already said, and he seemed generally liked in the community, or perhaps feared. I don't know. He was kind of a scary guy. I could, this kind of person, I could feel his presence through the walls of the house when he was there. His voice was cartoonishly deep, but his ideas and his attempts at humor were off, crooked. I've noticed this about big, scary men. Beneath their intimidating veneer, they're usually kind of dorky and squirrely. He was the only person who looked after the dogs, but because of the divorce, he didn't live at the house anymore, so his schedule was sporadic. He would come by when he felt like it or when he wasn't busy. He fed them only one scoop of food every other day, I was told, and he rarely let them out of their kennels, unless it was to go hunting. Most of the dogs hadn't left their kennels for six months. Some had been there even longer. Um... So I decided I would take it on myself to care for the dogs, even though, for the record, I'm more of a cat person. <laughs> just want to say. <laughs> I mean, I moved to Portland from San Diego. <laughs> I'm a cat person. For my, morning, for my morning routine, I get up and I fed the chickens first. Chickens and pigs, that was the easiest part. So there was chickens there, and the chickens hadn't been given much water. They had been kind of neglected, too. And that was the easy fix. I would just give them some grumbles, maybe some fruit or leftover food if we had it, change out their water. And then afterwards, I fed the pigs. And feeding the pigs was fun and easy. Every Thursday, a massive pile of apple bananas showed up, delivered from a local farm. I chopped off their branches with a rusted machete, loaded up a bucket, and poured it over the rock wall of the boar enclosure. Sometimes I would just stand there, watching the pigs eating the bananas, kind of spacing out, enjoying the shade of the small banyan tree, wondering just what the hell I was doing there. <laughs> but feeding the dogs, that was the real challenge. Because the dogs were hunting dogs. These weren't pets. They weren't behaved. They acted crazy when you went back there. So to prepare, I put on work clothes, rubber boots, Gloves, safety glasses. First, I got a hose, and I rinsed off all their feces, big, fat piles of creamy shit. And I, re <laughs> and I would refill their water buckets, which are usually kind of a green, emerald colored, because it was full of like rainwater. They must have been full of parasites. The dogs were undisciplined and neglected, of course. So they jumped up and down when I carried in food, causing shit water to be flicked directly at my eyeballs a lesson I had to learn the hard way after a very nasty pink eye scare, <laughs> hence the safety glasses. <laughs> if a dog got out, it prolonged the whole process. I had to chase it around, coax it back in. It was nuts. The dogs didn't know me. They didn't respect me. I'm just some dude. <laughs> and the middle kennel was the most difficult. It contained two especially rowdy, energetic dogs, constantly trying to knock the food bowl out of my hands or run away like they were mean humans. And every day, every day feeding the dogs, it was complete mayhem, like being in a fight. When I was done, I would just stand there dripping with sweat, and the dogs and I would just be looking at each other in silence. They're all happy. Their bellies were full. They were getting fed every single day. They're like, I don't know who this guy is, but I fucking love him. <laughs> but the situation was different for one dog. It was mostly like that, that mayhem. But for this one dog, in the far right kennel, there was a small dog who stood out to me. He didn't jump around all crazy. He didn't try to bolt when I fed him. And even if he did, he was tiny, so I could just grab him. He was quiet, friendly, with a little puppy face. It was so sad. He didn't seem like a hunting dog at all, even though I discovered his name was, ironically enough, Hunter. Hunter's kennel was covered in ivy when I first got there, which 
the ivy was in turn covered in fire ants, and the fire ants would get all over his food. His whole thing was just covered in fire ants. The scene was so tragic. I remember I was crying as I tore up all the ivy, and it let in more light. There's no more fire ants. I felt pretty good about that. And because he was so docile, I immediately started letting him out without bothering to ask permission. Fuck Gene's weird rules. I'm going to let this one dog out. I gave Hunter a bath. I let him roam the grounds. We became really good friends, Hunter and I. And the other people in the house got used to seeing him around. The problem was he couldn't stay in the house. Due to some medical problem or just bad manners, if Hunter had to take a piss, he just did it wherever he happened to be standing like some late-stage alcoholic. Returning Hunter to his kennel was maybe the hardest part of the day. As I carried him back, he always felt heavier in my arms. His tail would stop whacking. I could feel his heartbeat in my hand. I felt like an asshole every time. And I started asking questions, and I found out he used to belong to some old man in the neighborhood, but then that guy died, and... Gene, hearing about it, grabbed the dog, and him being an asshole, just added it to his collection. I don't know if the dog was trained much. Sometimes small dogs are used in pig hunting to help bite the genitals of the pig during like a pinning maneuver. Because dogs are kind of essential to pig hunting. Anyways, I could tell early on though, Gene didn't like me having Hunter around, but he allowed it. And also, he didn't like me feeding his dogs. He didn't say anything outright, probably because he lacks emotional intelligence. One day, he stopped by the property, and seeing that their ribs weren't showing anymore, said, the dogs are looking chubby, like they were models or something. Still, I mean, I was helping him. And I, anyways, I didn't give a shit about his opinion. I took it as an opportunity to make myself useful and try to improve things as much as I could. And anyways, feeding the dogs became the centerpiece of my day for most of my four months in Hawaii. It was a serious lesson. At the end of the day, to relax, I would drive down to the beach for a much-deserved swim, swigging stein lager, smoking ditch weed, and watching the sunset. <laughs> ditch weed sucks. As the days and weeks went by, I... I felt like I was getting the hang of this thing until what I feared the most almost happened. The most prized dog of the bunch, a muscular lab mix, squeezed past me and went straight for the pig enclosure and squared off with, an adult, with the big adult male on the other side of the enclosure. And the dog was jumping up and down, trying to get over the wall. I panicked because it didn't have a collar. I didn't know the dog's name. I don't even know what I was even shouting at it. And it didn't show much respect for me at that point. I had only been feeding it a couple of times, but I wasn't like Gene. It wasn't scared of me. And no matter how loud I shouted at the dog, it wouldn't listen. I thought for sure that dog was going to bite me if I grabbed it, but I was even more scared of Gene. If his best dog jumped the wall, that dog very easily would be killed or gored by the boar's tusks. I had no other choice but to grab the dog by the scruff of its neck like a puppy and drag him back to his kennel, which I hadn't really done. I didn't, it's just something I'd heard of. I didn't know much about grabbing dogs by their scruff. I had never done that. So I, I was like, but it was, the dog's about to die. It's about to get killed by a giant pig. So I grabbed it and I dragged it back. And thankfully, all it cared about was the pig, so I wasn't bit. After that incident, I felt more confident about what I was doing. It felt better. And this work was satisfying, much more satisfying than working at a desk all day. Still, the whole scene weighed on me emotionally. Despite all my concern, I felt helpless, really conflicted. I thought about it all the time when I was going to sleep at night. These dogs were being neglected. However, caring for them was how I was making ends meet there. I considered reporting the dog's neglect to a local nonprofit called Stop Hawaii Dog Abuse. They had ads alongside the highway and on the radio. It was everywhere. And that was actually kind of comforting to see that because it wasn't just me who saw that there was something going wrong with how hunting dogs are treated. And I wanted to do something, but I just didn't know what. And one night in downtown Hilo, I did some open mic at a bar. It didn't go well. 
And I ended up speaking to a local, though, who had experience with pig hunting and pig hunting culture. I told him about the situation with the dogs I was taking care of, and he said that, yes, it was a known issue that hunters will mistreat their dogs. But when I mentioned maybe reporting Gene to some agency, he was like, no. He gave me a pretty stern warning. He said, I wouldn't do that. Don't fuck with pig hunters. There's a lot of jungle out there, and a body can disappear quickly. <laughs> I was like, OK. <laughs> Fair enough. What dogs? <laughs> I mean, I wasn't entirely sure Gene would have murdered me if I reported him. But just the thought of that flesh giant beating me to death put the brakes on my activism efforts. And anyways, I couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I couldn't prove, I couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that anything illegal was happening to the dogs. The situation was in such a culturally ambiguous space. I mean, I'd have to change the whole society, start a petition, give a TED talk. It just wasn't that simple. I just had to accept that it is what it is. And all I could do was make the dogs' lives a little better while I was there. Also, truth be told, caring for them, I cared for myself. It was a really healing time for me. Also, I got to feel like a martyr, which is cool. <laughs> we all like feeling like martyrs. I liked going out at night to look at the stars by the kennels, too. I liked hanging out with the dogs just when I had free time. I would go out there. There wasn't much to do at night. The family was all busy. I was actually kind of out in the sticks. So I'd go out there and I would talk to the dogs. I'd be drinking beer and tossing treats to them, maybe singing to them. The whole experience helped me get out of my head. And after the previous years in Portland, that's exactly what I needed. I needed to stop thinking about comedy and all that bullshit. Just live. After a couple months, I left the house briefly to stay on a permaculture farm in Javi. It's on the north part of the island, and it was a work trade. Just, I needed a break. And while I was gone, and this is pretty satisfying, Mia's daughter, my host, her daughter and her boyfriend, they fed the dogs for me, which they had never done before. And after a couple of days, I got a text message. Hey, Christian, we had no idea how hard it was feeding the dogs. We can't believe you've been doing this for so long. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> it's like, it was pretty validating getting that text. I mean, after months of complaining and be irritating everyone, I finally felt understood. And I also admit it was very satisfying thinking those two out there covered in shit and sweat instead of inside the house watching Netflix. After a couple months, me and Jean's divorce was finalized, and the property was to be sold. My, my time there was running out, and I was just about ready to leave anyway. I thought about how cool it would be to adopt my, my favorite dog, Hunter. I ran the scenario through my head, staying on the island, him being my pet. I would have done it just for the dog, though. And also, it wasn't really possible. I wasn't making enough money to afford another place to live on the island. And most people there, they have to hustle really hard to live on the island. There's not much income to be had. Most people have two jobs. The prospect of having to hustle and grind just to survive on the big island made me realize it really was time to leave. Since the property was going to be sold, I asked what would happen with the animals. Gene himself told me that he had already built new kennels with better shade and even the ability to provide heating or fans as needed. I don't know why he was telling me this stuff. I was shocked. Gene was going to take better care of the dogs. And I think it was all my complaining and preoccupation with them. It left an impression. Or maybe it was the black belt and passive aggression I got from living in Portland. <laughs> Either way, I felt relieved. And even better, I found out someone was going to adopt Hunter. Mia's daughter made the arrangement. 
His new order his new owner was an old man with a bad leg. I'm not sure, I don't care, it doesn't matter. Just as long as the dog gets to live a full life before the old man dies. Which made me think though, if I hadn't been there, Hunter might have been stuck in another kennel. It was a legitimate happy ending for one dog at least. And there were plenty of other adventures I had on the island. I should at least give respect to that. I didn't just take care of dogs and suffer the whole goddamn time. I had a lot of fun. Of course, that's what you do in Hawaii. I had a lot of fun. I drove all around the island. I got to see exotic places few tourists ever get to see. I ate more spam than I'd care to admit. <laughs> and I encountered some of the most epic junk cars on the planet that I'd ever lays eyes on. <laughs> But there was one more test before leaving. On the morning before my flight back home, I walked out into the kitchen early in the morning in the house. I was barefoot. It was dim light. It was early in the morning. And I stepped on something really squishy, really gross. I was like, what's going on? And I turned on a light. And there's thousands of maggots everywhere. The kitchen counter, the floor, thousands of maggots. <laughs> yeah, I was barefoot. That's how I found it. It felt like some curse or some supernatural message from the island god Pele telling me to go back home. But cleanup was easy, though. I just swept the maggots off the kitchen counter, opened the back door, and I let in the chickens. Ten minutes, they were gone. I didn't know it before, but maggots are an excellent protein source for chickens. <laughs> As I watched them pick up the maggots one by one, I sipped my coffee, reflecting on the past few months of my life. <laughs> up until that point, I felt like a stereotypical mainlander bum, just washing ashore and back out to sea like a plastic bag. But for some reason, watching those chickens eat the maggots, I felt pretty damn sure I'd had my fill of island life. Stereotypes be damned. Two days later, I was back in Portland in the middle of winter, already looking for another place to go. But hopefully, when I get there, this time, I get to take care of cats. Christian Ricketts, ladies and gentlemen, Christian.